It's a pleasure to introduce Leia Wasser. Um, so she's done a lot of things for the uh, like computational earth science community. Um, she created the uh, the uh, Earth Analytics Program, um, so that, that was part of the Earth Island series. And uh, recently, she moved over to Tai OpenSide. She's the executive director of that. Um, and I think you'll enjoy a really fun talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jed, and thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, so psyched to be back on campus. So as Jen mentioned, I, I previously was here at CU and today I'm back to tell you a little bit about an organization that I'm developing and talk to you about open source software. And the premise of this talk is really this notion that data these days is this commodity and it's seen as this really valuable thing. But the thing about that data is we need the tools to use it. And so open source software is in fact a similarly valuable, if not more valuable commodity. And I want to just talk about some of the challenges associated with people that are working on this software and maintaining it. There we go. So as Jed mentioned, just a little bit about me. I previously worked at Beyond the National Ecological Observatory Work Network. I worked here at Boulder. And all of my programs that I've developed have been about helping people use data, um, specifically in the sciences. I am devoted to all things open, so open science, open source, and open education. And I'm a maintainer for the Strava package, which is a Python package for accessing Strava data. Me in the mountains, I love trails, and so that's where you can find me in my free time with my rescue pup, Gino. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about today is I'm gonna start with the significance of open source software in tech and in STEM and science, of course. The value and sometimes unrecognized value of that software, some of the communities that are driving the development and maintenance of open source and the conflict that we see there, um, some of the tension that we see there anyways. And then Pi Open Sci, which is this organization that I'm developing that's all about open peer review of software and supporting the maintainers that are developing these tools that a lot of us, if not all of us are using. So just a quick show of hands, and I can't see people on Zoom <laughs> if you're show, raising your hands, but have anyone in here, have you used open source software in your work? <laughs> so I'm guessing you all have, like if you use a Jupyter Notebook, that's an open source tool. And all of us are either using it directly or maybe interacting with it when we're using websites online without even sometimes thinking about it. And so this is a really commonly used XKCD comment about the value of open source. And it's so true, like it's so profoundly true. We've got this little peg leg that represents a small package that someone's maintaining in their volunteer time and is supporting this whole digital infrastructure. So my question to you is what happens when that maintainer, probably a volunteer, decides that they're burnt out, which happens, and they stop maintaining that package. And I'm gonna talk about an example that maybe some of you know of that exact thing kind of happening. But first let's talk about, and just get all on the same page, what am I talking about when I say open source software? So specifically today, I'm going to be talking about free and open source. Free is in, you don't have to pay for it. There is a history of the word free with open source that means something a little bit different, like gateway, free, open to do what you want. But I'm talking about financially, you're not paying for the software. And it's open source, which means openly available code, free to use. And the things that define open source software, there's actually 10 principles. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'll just tell you about a few of them. And there is a license associated with that software that's approved by the open source initiative. So a couple of those 10 principles, and I've got some links here, and I'm happy to like share this presentation after if you want to check out the links, click on them, that kind of thing. But a couple of the principles just to give you a flavor, free redistribution, so anyone can take that tool and use it as they want. The source code is publicly available. And not just visible, but you can actually use it, adapt it, and use it. 
modify it. And then the use doesn't discriminate in any way against other groups or fields. And then there's a suite of licenses. This is just a few of them. And the most common that we see in the science space is going to be BSD 3 clause and then the MIT license. But all of these are examples of approved licenses, and there's a much longer list if you go to the Open Source Initiative website. Okay, so back to that XKCD comic, what I now want to tell you about is the guy that broke the internet. Does anyone know this story by chance? Raise your hand. That's easy. <laughs> that does. Okay, so let me tell you the story. Great. Um, so JavaScript developer that is working on a whole bunch of cool open source JavaScript things. So here's the story. There's a company named Kick, big billion dollar company. They have some sort of chat app. I haven't used it before, but they're a big deal. And there's a lot of money behind them. And then there is, there is Kick, the open source package on NPM. It's a JavaScript package manager slash repository where you can publish your JavaScript code. And Kick says, hey, this is our name. Can we rename, can you, the developer, rename your package? And the developer is like, uh-uh, not doing it. My package this is open source. I want to keep the name. There's a whole back and forth, and it's a really interesting read if you want to check out. Um, there's a few blogs on this and what actually happened there. But the bottom line is NPM steps in and renames the package so that kit can have it. Now, lo and behold, the package maintainer, the developer is pissed, right? Because this is like his volunteer job. This is his love. He pulls the package along with all of his other packages. By the way, he had like 200, excuse me, 200 of them on NPM. And he's like, these are out of here. So now this one package that he was maintaining left pad is gone. You can't install it. Developers all over the place are having errors as they're working on their web development code. Everything is broken, including, ironically, the Kick website, <laughs> Facebook, because this one tiny package was supporting React.js. Not directly, it was a dependency of a dependency, not the tool that comes to your mind as being the thing that all these websites are using and everything goes down. Now, this is a great saga of a story. It actually all happened in like two and a half hours and the package got put back up onto NPM. And so it wasn't in fact, you know, multiple days of things breaking, but still profoundly impactful one open source package. One open source package that's about a dozen or less lines of code, tiny thing, broke everything. So this is a really interesting story to think about because it comes down to one of the things that we need to think about as developers and people in the open source community and people using open source software, which is this idea of good faith. Like we have this good faith that these open source tools are going to be maintained by developers and we're using that and it's great because it's free and it's open and the developers believe in that value of sharing software core value but good faith is pretty darn hard to maintain when these are people that are volunteering their time they're people that are using their tools but don't necessarily get support these are people that have users that sometimes don't value them as maintainers and they get angry bug reports and things happen that causes tension. And there's really not a good support system for open source outside of the open source community, which is an incredible community. So there's this real interesting conflict that happens and the tension would have that happens. And by the way, this open source community is not necessarily paying the bills. Like this is a lot of work that's going into these tools. So let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers associated with open source being used in tech, in STEM, and science. So this is a number I found that some say is even higher than this, that 80 to 90% of companies are using open source in some parts of their workflow or infrastructure. So 80 to 90%. And that number might be higher. 
the value of open source is estimated to be billions to trillions of dollars. So for example, in the UK, there was this value estimate that was about $60 billion a year that open source was providing that type of value to industry in the UK. Now look at these numbers. So this is a number from PyPy, the Python package index, also known as the cheese shop, for those of you that have been in the Python world for a long time. And cheese shop has over 433,000 Python packages, just Python. Now there's numerous other open source languages, right? We've got Rust, we've got JavaScript, like we go on and on. So this is one number for just PyPy and just Python. Now look at this next number. This is the number 18 trillion downloads last month of those Python packages on PyPy. Now, this is an 18 trillion people installing things. There's a bunch of ways that things get installed. Like if you know about continuous integration or testing, there's you know cloud-based services that are installing things and testing things, but still this is one month of Python package use, massive. Right, even if it's like a fraction of this number, it's massive and it's one language. Okay, so back to our developer that was working on JavaScript and a company came in and there was that tension, that conflict. Let's just talk about open source and the values surrounding open source because what's really important here is that it is about community values around shared programs. And this is fundamental. Like this is language that's coming back from the 80s. If you look at the history of open source and this idea of this hacker ethic that a bunch of people developed back in the 80s. But a lot of that fundamental value around open source is still there. Like if you talk to developers, they still believe that they want to make change through shared open software. And they believe in that principle to the core. And so this particular, our JavaScript developer, he said this, he said, I owe everything I have to the people that never gave up around this open source philosophy. This developer was not someone that even went to college, but they had four tools that industry was using, right? It's really valuable. And this developer was not paid to do any of that work. So you can see how this tension starts to grow, right? So let's talk about now what the open source community looks like, because I've painted a picture of the value and numbers and such. But what I want to talk to you next about is the effort that goes into maintaining these packages. So here's just a simple diagram. And in the middle, we have an open source tool that's sitting on GitHub. And I'll talk about GitHub in just a moment. Maybe it's NumPy, maybe it's whatever open source tool that comes to your mind. You know, Jupyter, whatever tool. And there's kind of three main groups of people that are going to engage with that tool in different ways. So you've got the maintainers. They're actually doing the work to keep the package alive and maintained and current, writing the code, writing the documentation. You've got the software users, and then you've got people that are contributing to that package in different ways. Those ways could include bug reports or issues, code updates, lots of different ways that people can contribute to packages and not be an actual maintainer. Now the size of that maintainer or maintainers varies. So like in the science, scientific Python ecosystem, a lot of times that's just one person, but sometimes it's a team. And then the size of this user community can vary too, depending on how general or specific the package is and just how broadly used it is. So let's look at two Python specific examples. So on the left here, we've got NumPy, which is super common, popular. I see some of you shaking your heads like, yeah. So this is a raise, really popular Python package. And then over here, we have this little smaller Python package that is a Strava API wrapper. So much different user base, 132 million downloads a week versus 4,000 downloads a week. 50 to 60 maintainers versus two to four maintainers over here. It used to be one maintainer actually. As these packages get bigger, 
and bigger as in not more code, but as in more people using them, more popular, what you see is this higher demand for maintaining them. So this is a segment of the maintainer team for NumPy. All of these people, and they have sub teams, which is really cool, right? They've got a docs team, they've got the actual code maintainers, a triage team for all the issues, web team for their online presence. This is a lot of human resource power right there. And most of these people have other jobs, like Ralph Gomers, he leads Quonsite company, directs that company. So these are people that are volunteering their time because they believe in the value that NumPy provides to the community, which is huge value. But NumPy, like all of these other packages, has to figure out ways to fund their work or its volunteer work. So again, think about this tension of balance. Like in this perfect world, you have maintainers doing amazing things and people are like, yes, you're amazing. We love that this software is free. And we would love to see this type of situation where it's these thoughts going back and forth. There's some bugs, we'll fix them, everything's good. Back and forth. But really, we see this, where we've got a small maintainer team, we've got a big user community, and some of those users might get pissed off when something breaks. And then what happens? We have this conflict, the maintainers don't feel appreciated, and there's just a tension there. And tension can go both ways. Some maintainers get pissed off when you report a bug. That does happen. But the point being here is that this is ne not necessarily the happy place full of bunnies and flowers and sunshine all of the time because there's these inherent tensions between business models and brand open source value, things being open and free, but also maybe not being pushed around by this, that business model. Users who want tools to work, maintainers who also want tools to work, but boy, they're stretched in time and resources to do that work. So maintenance takes a lot of time and it's not just time associated with code, it's the whole package. And I'm gonna talk about what that package looks like, at least in the Python space, next. And again, maintainers burn out. And this is a common issue or thing, part of life. People work on something and then need to move on. So what happens to those tools? So what are the structural parts of an open source project? And I want to really be specific and say a Python open source project, because that's the area where I'm really focused on right now. So there's a bunch of pieces. So on the right here are kind of all the things that you can expect to find in a GitHub repository, things being files or sets of files. So on the bottom, you've got that license we talked about. That's a pretty straightforward thing. You add that once, it's done. Readme file, code of conduct. This file is really important because your code of conduct defines how you interact with the community as a maintainer and how the community interacts with you. And if the community is not being respectful, a community member, there needs to be a way to say like, hey, this isn't okay. So this is a really important piece of a GitHub repositories files. You've got documentation. You saw that NumPy had a whole maintainer team associated with documentation. You've got your user facing documentation that helps users understand how do I use this tool? And then you've got your API documentation, which is the stuff which is the information that tells someone more technical, like there, these are the classes, these are the data structures, these are the inputs and outputs that this method or this function expects. You've got a test suite to make sure that things work as you think they should, and to make sure that if someone is suggesting a change to that code on GitHub, that it doesn't break everything else, it's really important. And then a contributor, and maintenance guide. Those might not seem quite as important, but if you want people from the community to help, you need to give them instructions on how to do that in a way that works with your maintenance style. On this side, you have infrastructure. So I mentioned GitHub as one of the, if not the most popular place for open source software hosting right now. That's where a lot of these packages live. There's GitLab and some others as well. And the benefit of it is that there's a version control platform called Git running on the back end. So you've got version control now. 
Continuous integration. So that's these cloud-based services that you can customize to run certain things like your tests. And what's beautiful about that is, if, again, if someone submits that change to the code, it can test their, your documentation. It can test your code. It can test your code format. So think about things like linting, making sure you're following, say, PEP 8 or whatever code guidelines that you have for your code so it's readable. And then packaging and deployment. And I'll tell you a little story here about this piece. When I started working on Strava Lib, the maintainer was a sole maintainer, but he had a really active user base in his GitHub repo. He was the only person that could deploy a release to PyPy. And he was doing it locally, which is totally cool, you know, typing in the things that he needed to, to, to type to package and deploy to PyPy. But there hadn't been a release of Strava Lib for like over a year, and there were all these bugs. So people were starting to fork the repository and try to change the code themselves, and it was getting messy. And so one of the first things that we did when we started a maintenance team was we set up a continuous integration-based deployment so that any maintainer now can step in and deploy if they have permissions. And all of that is documented in the maintenance guide. What that means for this developer, the original developer, he is super psyched that this is happening. It's not all on his shoulders. We can bring in a new maintainer and we can say, here's the documentation so you can come up to speed and we'll help you. And now that maintainer can also deploy if they need to or work on other parts of the code. So this is like a lot of pieces, but it's important to the overall health, both short-term and long-term of the package. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about GitHub and how that fits into this open source equation. And I'm using GitHub now, platform could change, but the really important part here is that GitHub is a place that allows collaborative coding. So this is the place where maintainers who might live all over the place can work together asynchronously. And some people have called it, um, like a community-based coding or social coding, you might hear those terms. And it really facilitates interactive code review. So you can look at every line of the code and say, this is good, this isn't good, maybe we should think about making this change. So there's a real dialogue that can happen around changes to the software. And of course there's version control. So someone messes up, we can figure out who did it and probably it's not that they messed up, but people make mistakes, typos, whatever, and we can undo them or just at least know, okay, we had a break at this particular commit. Let's revisit that and see why. Here are these little green checks. This is our continuous integration checks. Green is good, green is yay, everything's passing. A red X is the thing you don't wanna see. And then you can also see this approved. So what these are, these are lists of, this is a list of pull requests. Here you can see, this is from StravaLib, and here you can see the first release 1.0 that happened after a year, and you can see that the maintainer team approved it. And this maintainer team is like all over the place. I don't know what time zone there. I just know that the other two people I work with, they're working in the middle of the night and I wake up and I see all of their comments and then I'm working during the day. So it's this really interesting dynamic of, of timing, but it's pretty cool, right? You're working with people from all over the world. And this is really common for these maintainer teams. Issues. So these are GitHub issues. This is where a user might come to say, hey, there's a bug. Hopefully they have some reproducible code that helps us find out like exactly what's triggering the bug. Um, but also they could come to say, hey, I saw an issue in your documentation. I'd like to make a change. And they start to talk to the maintainers asynchronously through issues. And you can see that we have these tagged as different types of issues that we might use to prioritize when we address them. And then here is an example of one of the maintainers, again, this is Stravalib, saying, hey, we're thinking about using this other tool to develop this model for how we're parsing the API data. And let me show you this example when he attaches files and all this information that I need to go and play with it locally and say, oh yeah, this looks cool. Or say, huh, this isn't quite working the way I think it should. So it's really this collaborative space. 
And then this is the line by line commenting on a single line of code and again, facilitating that conversation. So this is a really powerful tool in terms of open source development. So at this point, we've talked about why open source is so important. We talked about massive impact that it has on both tech, on science, and we haven't talked about the science quite yet, but STEM. And we talked about these complex interactions that happen between developers, contributors, and users. And that, you know, it's just hard to maintain a package. It takes a lot of time and effort. So for the last chunk of this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about PyOpenSci, which is an organization that I'm developing in the space of Python open source software. To understand PyOpenSci, the thing that you need to think about is what is open reproducible science? So open reproducible science is this idea that a scientist, and in these days, science is becoming increasingly data intensive. So we're talking about scientists doing data science. And the workflow rate will span from finding the data, downloading it, opening it, processing it, analyzing it. There's a whole spectrum of steps. So open reproducible science is this idea that that workflow is open and transparent in a way that someone else could take that person's work and build on top of it rather than recreating that entire initial workflow. So there's efficiency there associated with that scientist and their science rather than having to reinvent the wheel, that code is usable by the next person at least part of it, maybe some of it isn't fully able to, you can't fully recreate every step, but as much as possible. Transparency of methods. So you read science papers or any kind of journal article and you see methods, but you know if you're talking about data science, there's all kinds of nuances associated with processing the data that can bias your results. And so that journal article is wonderful, but what's even better is to see exactly how they did that so you can replicate that workflow end to end. That's like kind of the gold standard for reproducibility. So this is really important to science. And guess what drives these workflows? Open source software. And there's a few other things about open source software that make it really valuable here. One is this idea of leveling the playing field, because if you don't have to pay for licenses, more people can engage with that source code. So anyone can download Python if they have a computer that has some kind of ability to compute things, some kind of memory and processor resources, they can start to learn Python and work on various code bases once they have those skills. And again, it just facilitates scientists creating things that are truly open, that you don't have to worry about licenses as a barrier. So in Python specifically, there's this really interesting ecosystem, and we talked about NumPy already. We talked about those 32 million downloads every week. And some of these core packages they have a huge volume of use and they have a huge volume of use because they're the most generic in the sense that they do a broad set of things that a lot of people need to do with their data. So PyOpenSci is not focused on this side of the, this is the long tail. It's a poorly drawn curve here. That, that's all me and my, my drawing skills. But imagine that this is, you know, a, a proper tail <laughs> and these tools are really in the scope of another project that's working on the scientific Python community that's called Scientific Python, by the way. And we, PyOpenSci, is really focused on this long tail of more domain specific tools. And so some of these tools like Pandera has maybe half a million downloads a month. They're still pretty widely used, but they're just not the NumPy's. So what's happening now in the science space is that there's this push towards this career track of research software engineering. 
And that just really is a developer that's focused on scientific software development. So trying to push for a career track for these people that are in science labs, developing really cool tools to make a space for them in academia and in science. Because there's a value gap. So in your traditional academic credit system, peer-reviewed publications are valued, whereas tool development traditionally hasn't been as valued. So there's a disconnect there. There's historically been a disconnect there in terms of value. There's also this lack of community support for a lot of developers in this science space that I already kind of alluded to, where they're trying to create this these tools, but they're kind of off doing it on their own in their own labs. So there's not a lot of points of connection with other developers that might have similar challenges. There's also this really interesting challenge where sometimes people get funding to build tools, which is great, but it's two years of funding. And we know that if you have a user base, that thing needs to be maintained for more than two years. So what happens then? And so there's some thought that needs to be considered around should we build this tool or should it just be an internal tool and how does that work because again remember that you know extreme case of that javascript left pad package you would have thought that would bring down so many so many websites there's also this truth in python that packaging is really messy it's kind of hard to figure out what the best practices are and what modern packages should look like and there's answers to these questions but it's not well organized in the ecosystem. So people get, sometimes they get a little bit lost or confused in terms of what the best practices should be. And they're constantly, there's a lot of evolution in that space right now. And so you see a lot of inconsistency in package quality or package, um, yeah, package quality. Now on the other side of the spectrum, you have the scientists that are using those tools and they have their own frustrations, very real frustrations. If there's 10 packages on PyPy that do the same thing, so if you look at a Twitter API wrapper, that's a great example, there's like 20 of them. How do you know which one to pick to use in your workflow? And is that package going to be maintained next year? Is that package maintained now? It might not be. So you have to dig and like figure this out. Um, lack of inconsistent quality of documentation. This is really hard when I've been building in the past years lessons on working with remote sensing data. Sometimes I was like going into the package code to figure out how it works because the documentation wasn't there. So that's not sustainable for a big group of users. And lack of tutorials, that kind of thing. But we can understand why that happens, right? Because again, maintainers are taxed in terms of their time. And then there's this education gap, which is so, so important, where the users, we, I talked about this, but I'll say it again, the users don't understand that there's actual people developing these tools. And while they might be pissed that there's a bug in the software, and the maintainer doesn't get back to them right away, there's more often than not a really good reason for why the maintainer can't get to that issue. And it's not like a personal thing, right? They want to, they just can't. They don't have the capacity to get to every bug in time. So that's another you know, tension point that hits science. And again, tension, 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 open source community users. So Pi Open Sci is about building diverse community around scientific open source software. And we're doing it through peer review, training and online resources and mentorship. And I'm gonna talk focus purely on the peer review part for the last five, 10 minutes of this talk. So we have an open peer review process, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by open peer review and how that works. And the goal of that peer review process is not only to try to standardize Python packaging in the scientific community, so to get people following some best practices, it's also to think about software as being something that you can cite and making sure there's a citable entity on those packages that people can use if they're writing papers. It's about, PyOpenSci is about creating resources for best practices around Python packaging, because what I just had said a few minutes ago is that it really is a messy space, but we think that if we put some really solid maintained 
documentation on what are the current best practices that that'll help because people can use those resources to make decisions when they start to create a Python package or update their package. Tutorials and training around those best practices and then this community piece. So to create a place where people that are say that research software engineer track or they're in that lab developing that tool that people are using, they can come and get help from other maintainers in this community. So this is what the peer review process looks like. And the entire open peer review process happens on GitHub. And it uses a lot of those same features that I was showing you that, that we use to engage with each other as maintainers and with our users. We're using those same features to implement an open peer review. So the first part of the peer review process is either a pre-submission inquiry, which is really a maintainer saying, hey, is this in scope for you guys to review? We do have a scope of things that we can and can't review. Or they can submit an actual package for review directly because maybe they're just confident that it's in scope. And what's really cool, and I'll show you an example of this, in this early step, we have an editor-in-chief that will step in that will talk to the maintainer and it's a conversation that says, hey, your documentation is in an unusual format. What do you think about moving it to this other more common format that's easier for your users to find? Or, hey, you've structured your package in a way that's not really conventional for Python. So starting to get to those standards in these very early stages of the peer review process. And so that looks something like this. This is actually a review that's, ha that's starting right now. Like you can go online, this person submitted in the last week. And a lot of these comments are from the last couple of days. And you don't need to read all the text, but what I want you to see here is that this peer review is not a situation where we're critiquing the maintainer. It's a conversation between the maintainer and the reviewers or the editor or the editor-in-chief with the goal of making the package more usable more standardized and just easier to maintain over time. So it's a conversation rather than a critique. And there's a link here, if any of you all wanna like check it out in GitHub um, and see the whole conversation as it's unfolding. This is the top of what one of those issues looks like when someone submits for review. Again, this is a GitHub issue. So we have the submitting author, this, particular package has a whole maintainer team. Name of the package, GitHub repository link, we assign reviewers. This is, in this case, the citable ID is a Zenodo DOI, but I'm gonna talk about JOS, the Journal of Open Source Software, in just a moment. So this is kind of the metadata for the review on GitHub. And so again, the editor looks at those early either the review submission or the pre-submission inquiry. And then the review is all about a conversation, similar to the conversation that happened in that first step between the reviewers and the package maintainers who approve the package. Now, once the package is accepted into our ecosystem, there's a few things that happen. One, we do annual maintenance checks to make sure that that package is still maintained because we wanna keep a list of vetted tools. And that author has a badge on their readme that says PI Open PI approved. So if it's no longer maintained, we need to think about a way to sunset that and we're gonna work with the maintainer to do that. Or we're gonna to try to find them a new maintainer or maintainer team, if that's an option. The package is now visible to the community as a vetted tool within our catalog. It has support of the PyOpenSci community and we have developers and people that can help them with technical questions if they need help. But the maintainer still owns the tool. So we have no ownership here. It's really just embracing them as a part of the community and giving them some support. And this does not address the financial challenges. So notice I haven't talked about that because we don't have a great solution to that problem yet, but what we're trying to focus on is this consistency of packaging, consistency of maintenance, scientists or whoever wanting to find tools that are vetted rather than looking through those 20 Twitter API wrappers on PyPy and having to dig through each one. But the maintainer still owns their package. And this process 
is highly inspired by another organization called Our Open Side. That's a partner organization that we work really closely with, but they're on the R side. So that's all I have. I wanted to just highlight the fact that I'm here talking about Pi Open Sci and open source. There's so many people involved in this, and this is just on the Pi Open Sci side of things. We have an awesome editorial board and our advisory coordinating committee. I'm missing a few people here, but really great people that are advising the development of this organization. Here is, if you're interested in getting in touch with me, my email, and I'm on Twitter and Pi Open Sci is on Twitter. Eventually I'm gonna move Pi Open Sci over to Mastodon as well in this great migration that's happening right now. And I just wanted to thank the Sloan Foundation because we have funding because of them. They are a philanthropy and we are really excited to have their support for the next few years. And just, we are fiscally sponsored by community initiatives. So that's all I have to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Thank you so much for inviting me today, Deb, and I'm super just happy to have this opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm pretty convinced about uh, PyOpenSci as uh, like a research kind of institution, but I was wondering, um, what your opinion would be in this game or in like the industry. So like your kick example, you said I think that it broke Facebook, for example, because there was some react thing going on. Um, I was wondering just do you think that maybe in that case like the companies have responsibility to not use packages that are for the campaign or should the onus be kind of on the open source community as well? Because I guess like in terms of security vulnerabilities, yeah. you know, if you're using a small maintained package, I would say Oh, you know, Google does that and it breaks and it's kind of on them. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think would be a good approach that would be similar for like the industry side of things in addition to that. Yeah, and I I don't have like a the good perfect answer for you, but like the, the whole like log for J security vulnerability, right? Like that was crazy. That every system that you were logging into was impacted by that. That's another security is another whole other world, and that's a great example. In terms of who, where the onus is, it's, it's a good question. I know some people, in fact, I was just talking to someone who's like the head of, this, of a small software company, and he's like, I refuse to use open source software. And he said, and he knows I'm in this space, and he said, I hate it. He didn't, he didn't actually mean like he hates it. But he, he's struggling with exactly what you're describing, right? Because they have no control if that happens, and it can take down their whole platform. So in terms of the onus, there are some people that would do exactly what you said and say, like, we're not going to use open source software exactly because it's it's a liability. But the reality is that if you're creating a platform and there's some tool that already does the thing that you need to do, there's a huge efficiency factor there. So I don't have a good answer to your like it's a hard, it's a hard question. And I don't know what the perfect solution is, but I know that I've seen both responses. I've seen no. If you're Google or whatever his company is named, like we're developing everything from the bottom up and we're not going to rely on open source. But then I've seen other instances where you have a startup and they don't have the resources to, to do all that development and redo that development. So I'm not answering your question, <laughs> but I'm recognizing that it's, it's a really hard problem. So, uh... With respect to reliability, I, when Wikipedia came along, I, on whatever, the party asked teachers about Wikipedia and said, oh, no, 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 I don't allow my students to use Wikipedia because everyone can, uh, if everyone can write something, then how do we know is that it is any good? And then it's a rare, I mean, uh, we could compare, uh, compare Wikipedia as an analogy to open source software versus Encyclopedia Britannica versus commercially produced software. And then there was a nice article in Nature showing that Wikipedia actually does very good compared to Encyclopedia Britannica. And there are slogans like, if all, uh, if there are enough eyeballs, all bugs, uh, so, 
if you your inspiration for open sky, uh, could it also become influenced from Wikipedia, or do you see fundamental differences between Wikipedia, which is also a kind of community effort versus open source? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And I think you're so you're talking about you know this idea of crowdsourced information and having all of these eyes on it leading to potentially a better answer than the two reviewers that are review or however many are reviewing the published Encyclopedia Britannica. And I think, you know, I again this is a this is a really hard question, but the one thing I can say is that finding the technical knowledge to, to work on these tools, crowdsourcing that would be really hard. Because for example, if we're talking about domain specific tools, so I'm just going to start in this Python space, because if we go out to like the huge tech sector that becomes even more complicated, but in the science development, there's normally a domain knowledge that you need, and there's a technical knowledge that you need if you're processing certain data types. So I think what would be really I think that the idea of crowdsourcing is an awesome idea and could really work. I think in application, it would be hard because it would be hard to find enough people to like do that level of review, to take the time that have the right domain experience, that have the right technical experience. So I don't know how that would work, but it would be pretty amazing if it could work. I will say that there is a little bit of that on GitHub in the sense if you have a community of contributors and for something like NumPy, you might, you know, those 60 people, maybe some subset of them could look at it. So it's at least better than just one person looking at it. But I think implementing it would be really hard. But if someone figures out how to do that, like that would be an amazing thing to have. Well, and add one issue. Yes. Yeah. I mean, let's say I buy a Mac or Microsoft Word. Yeah. And I find it personally useful. And yeah. then I show it to a colleague of mine, and she or he says, Oh, I would like to have that too. And so, I mean, we have sort of you know, bottom up extensions starting this from a size one to maybe to a size five inside a little research group at a, uh, at a university. And I completely agree with you that in the end, you, you, in order for making this work, you have to find enough resor uh, yeah. resources. You have to find enough people who are interested in something. I don't know whether you, know, you only need tons or tens or hundreds to make something like this happen. But to identify these islands, that someone does something interesting, which can be used by other people, I think this is maybe addresses a little bit the issue which you, which you say, we need enough people uh, to worry about something. Yeah. And you know, one thing that also, no, I, I hear you, and that's it's such a good point. So, and one thing that we've also been thinking about, but again, I don't know exactly how this is going to be implemented, is one of the pieces that we're hoping to implement in the future is working with subcommunities. So there's a lot of these subcommunities that I think are kind of what you're starting to get at with this idea of that macro. And then you get this small community of people that are using it and might be able to evaluate how useful it is. We've been talking about working with communities in that way that say are geosciences or some specific subdomain where you might have multiple people with experience in that specific topic that could at least have standards related to that community and then vet the software through the community. But it's not exactly the same as what you're talking about, like that Wikipedia model of all eyes on the code, because again, I. I still think you're going to have that problem with getting enough eyes with enough of the technical expertise to like dig in to all the pieces. But I'm not saying it's not possible. I just have a hard time envisioning like how it would work at scale. Yeah. Oh, I have a question that is inspired by my own experience when I was a graduate student in Anapostante involved and contributed to different 
software packages that were, you know, had a lot of people on them for a couple of years and were funded by NSF or DOE or something, and everyone was really excited about them. And they have quite a bit of infrastructure. I mean, this was, I was part of really, you know, for academic groups, pretty advanced in terms of software engineering. But then that grant ended, and there's no one really maintaining that software anymore. And so now, yeah, anyway, I'm just kind of curious what you have, but what thoughts you have on that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's, that's a real, I mean, that's a real challenge. And there's another truth that I didn't mention that even if you had those okay. same, whoever the people like yourself and others that were working on the tool, uh, getting funding for maintaining software is a lot harder than right. getting funding for like the shiny new thing. So even if you wanted to continue to maintain, there's like this challenge, this kind of ironic challenge of like, it's hard to do that, it's hard to fund that. And philanthropies are actually starting to fund some of that, but it's still, it's too massive of a problem for them to, to fund all of it. So, so yeah, that is a problem. and. We actually have two packages right now where I suspect that's gonna be the case where it's a lab, the, the PI of the lab, like the head of the lab has graduate students working on these tools. We reviewed them, but one of the postdocs is actually um, on our editorial board now. So I'm pulling her in and I'm saying, hey, is this thing gonna be maintained long-term and what's the plan? And we're talking about that. So. I don't have the perfect solution to it, but what I hope is one of two things happen. If the reality is that there's no more funding and we can't find someone to come in and maintain the package, there's not enough community adoption of the tool that someone else might wanna come in and take it over just as a volunteer effort, then the next best thing is to just sunset it and let the community know. So rather than just stopping and the, the repo goes dark, and then what happens if people are using it, there's forks and all kinds of mess can happen from that. Let the community know, you know, submit an issue like, hey, we have to sunset this package, update the readme so that, and put us your release to PyPy. So it says this is no longer being maintained when people scan through PyPy and like at least follow those steps. It's not the perfect solution, but at least it's something that will make the users have a better experience to know that it's no longer being maintained. But it's hard. Yeah. Really <laughs> great. Um, you kind of had a bullet point talking about titles and size and diversity. Um, and how have been able to look forward or experience with this, but looking at you know like toxicity within the open source community or kind of like hegemonic social scripts that are enacted, and maybe how you know identity functions in a role as like how people are treated within that community and how discourse happens. And I was wondering if you could like talk a little bit more about that or what it could be or if high open science is going to Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you. So the question was around, you know, how we, and I had a bullet that was like this tiny bullet that's actually this massive challenge and problem and thing that we really want to address, which is how can we diversify this space? And in fact, you know, the, the tech sector is has a diversity problem and the diversity problem is even more extreme in open source which is not necessarily surprising because people often are paid for these resources now you have people that already have these challenges in terms of the level of privilege that they have in our society and you're asking them to do work for free it's just you know that that, that system doesn't work out very well in their favor at all at all so we haven't implemented these programs yet, but the idea is that rather than being that the wheel in this space, we're gonna partner with some of the organizations that are already doing an amazing job in this space. So on the kind of women in STEM, there's high ladies. Uh, there's this really fantastic organization called the Geo Latinas, which is working in, in that space in kind of the geospatial data space, but they are you know, Latino women that are empowered and using Python and R and programming. There's a geo-indigenous um, effort as well for indigenous uh, people that identify as indigenous um, and native. 
And so the goal is that we're going to set up an AP mentorship program. I don't think that just partnering with people is enough and providing some funding to people that might not otherwise have an opportunity to get that open source experience and providing training and mentorship in, yeah, in GitHub, but also like some of the GitHub and interactions that I talked about in terms of tricking. And my hope is it's not going to be like tens of thousands of people, but that we can make impact on individuals or small cohorts within those communities to empower them and that those skills that they're going to pick up through open source, I think it's harder to get through doing that, they're still really good career development skills that are in demand, you know, in tech. So that's that's the hope. And then on the other elements of like the discourse and how people are treated and gender identity, what I've been working on and I hope to create a, I plan to create a committee around the code of conduct, which I think is really important. So that if someone has interaction, whether it's in our Slack group, whether it's on GitHub, whether it's at an event, like I don't know what the, you know, in a, where the interaction happens, if it's mid to high or high, they know what they can do to report it and that we will take action. And I think that that code of conduct, I had mentioned that earlier kind of in passing, but that's really important that people understand that we aren't the space that's going to tolerate any kind of. So it doesn't solve all the problems, but the goal of the organization is that like that was one of the first things that I started working on, and that diversity piece needs to be embedded in our organization from the start, and it needs to be shown in our leadership in our communities that there needs to be a diversity of people at all levels in the organization, and so that's where I'm starting. And if you have other ideas or thoughts, like I would love to talk to you more because I obviously you know don't know. But I'm not going to pretend to know everything, but I've definitely done work in this space, and I know that this is a huge learning process for getting involved. So I'm just hoping that we can be a different type of organization. Yes. So much. Do I just 